<laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't wait till post draft. I uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good good part of it. Does just settle a little bit. Uh, who was just talking about? I think my mom was just talking about this. Yeah, I've seen it before. What are your thoughts on, on how? I saw it a long time ago. Uh, very unrealistic, you know. So you know, it's like anything about your job. When is that unrealistic? It's hard to accept, but uh, it makes for good movies. So I understand that. Could they make a movie out of the Bengals draft room, or would just not be too boring? I'd watch it. Yeah. You'd watch it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just trying to anticipate decisions you're going to have to make. You know, I think Duke does a great job. Um, Mike, everybody, really just facilitating discussions that you want to have now as opposed to um, one pick away, two picks away. You know, just trying to anticipate. Part of those conversations involve if player A, B, C, or maybe down to 15 is gone, possibly trading back out of the first round, acquiring an extra pick. I'll let Duke answer anything about trades or anything like that. But yeah, just comparing this player versus that player, how it fits us, I think those are big conversations right now. I don't think anything's ever a sure bet. You know, you just got to um, feel good about where you're picking and how they fit for you and what the vision is and, and go from there. But. Um, you know, whether whether you're picking in the top 10 or at the end of the first round, it's it's hard to say anything's ever a sure bet. You know, you've always got that feeling. Um, but but again, it's just finding guys that fit us and can help us win. That's that's the key thing that we focus on. Paul, at some point, do you feel like you know your identity now more than ever? What fits prospect-wise, what doesn't? Part of that probably being continuity. I, I think every year that passes, you know, your team changes, your offense changes, your defense changes. So you continue to evolve, but um, you know you you know your roster a lot better. Haven't been around some of these guys for a number of years now. Some of them one or two years, and so you just got a better sense of maybe that what'll what'll help you um, continue to play at a high level. That, that's what we're looking for. Zachary, college tackles getting harder and harder to evaluate, and, and what do you look for to maybe project that guy can be a, an NFL lineman? It, it's that's a difficult position. I think it always has been, you know, because some guys. Um, maybe have played other spots and you're projecting them to a spot. Um, some of it's hard because, you know, one of the toughest to s toughest positions to play against is defensive end in this league because that's where oftentimes you'll go into a game and maybe the other team's best player is a defensive end. And so those guys have a tough job to do. And so asking a guy, um, you know, who's coming into his first year from college football to go block some of these guys is, is a tall task. And... Um, people quickly say whether or not they're successful or not, you know, in their first year. And sometimes it takes some time to develop and experience. And, um, you know, so we, we've got a collection of guys that we've drafted over the years that are now in their third or fourth year that um, we've seen continue to progress, which is exciting to see. As far as running back goes, what do you look for, like, in a running back, especially, you know, kind of up there in that first top tier of you know, running backs out there? Well, I think there's a number of things you can you can look at, you know, whether um, what's his first, second down value, what's his third down value, can it protect, can he win um, in one-on-one -on -one matchups with linebackers. And um, so, so really, um, you, you can give a description based on which guy you want to see fit into your room. Um, piecing together running back rooms is always interesting like that. Yeah, some guys are easier than others. And, and so again, just um, it's part of just when, when you interview guys, asking their protection knowledge. And um, that's, that's part of what you have to gain in the scouting process. Are they capable of doing it? Just because they didn't do it on their college tape, do we think that we can project them as somebody who's able to do it? Um, it's, it's a hard thing to project sometimes. Um, so it, but that's part of the process that you have to follow. Knowing who to block, yeah, being being disciplined number one, being willing number two. Um, no, it's it's harder than people realize. You know, it's just the discipline of understanding um, some of the third down looks you're going to see. You know, we spend a lot of time um, on all that, and so when when you talk about protections, number one is are they capable of understanding um, 
it's not always an easy riddle to solve as you're standing there and the clock's coming down and it's loud and you can't hear and you have to really understand uh, the answers to the test um, so that the quarterback can trust you. And, and then number two, you're willing to do it. Um, there's plenty of guys who have uh, been big guys that are great pass predictors. There's plenty of guys that have been around that are small guys that are good pass predictors because they're willing to do it. Um, they understand how to do it, how to meet the guy at the line of scrimmage before he can gain more space on you. And um, So again, I, I've seen a myriad of types of players who are good pass protectors. It doesn't all come down to size. Um, that doesn't hurt, obviously. But uh, it, it's an understanding of who to block and a willingness to do it. How much offense flexibility does that give, uh, give you as a play caller when you have a, a running back who can, you can trust in pass protection also kind of give you some value snaps for a second down? Well, you know, it's, it's always things you can work around. That's why, that's why you don't just always play one running back. You know, there's always uh, multiple guys in the room, usually carry four on the roster, typically three or four. Um, and each one of them brings, brings a little bit different value. I don't, I don't think we look at it as difficult. You know, you just, um, you know, you got to have your, your top 28 there that you're willing to take just because that's where you pick. Um, it's not that much different when you're picking, uh, where did we get Jamar Fifth? Um, and then we had, what, the, the 36th pick or 37th, you know? So it's, it's the same conversations, really. Um, you're just picking a, a couple picks up maybe earlier than a, a second round pick that we had a couple of years ago. But uh, again, I, I think Duke and everybody in that room does a really good job of having the conversations we need to have. So in terms of strategies, kind of like almost preparing for like a second round pick to start with? However you want to phrase it, it's the 28th pick, it's in the first round. Um, yeah, it's three picks away from being a second round pick. So um, at the end, it really doesn't matter whether guys, other than the fifth year option, whether guys are first round pick or second round pick. It's can they come in and help you win games? Yeah, I mean, Keem's filled a, a number of roles for us over the years, you know, so he, he's a smart player um, who's willing to, to do whatever it takes to help us win. That's key. Um, Deontay's a guy that's continuing to, to try to make the most of his opportunities. We've used him in big tight end roles in the past as well. And so, again, just trying to find roles for these guys to get on the field so that when you do need them in, in a big moment, um, they've been on the field and they've played. And I think Frank does a great job of moving those guys around in practice uh, to try to get them experience in different positions because you just never know what position they're going to have to play in the game when, when you're a backup offensive lineman, um, which, which those guys have, have done off and on for us over the years. And then, uh, He'll come. He'll compete at right tackle. You know, so his first spot for us will be right tackle. But he's got the flexibility to play guard as well. So um, it's good to have linemen that can come in and and compete at different positions for you. Do you lose sleep a couple of days before the draft? I mean, anticipation of everything. Lose sleep? No. You know, I think it's a fun process to be a part of. Um, and then you get on the clock and you get to make that decision. And and our scouts have put in so much hard work. You know, it's it's. Uh, probably different for them, you know, because this is they've spent the entire year traveling, so much travel, so many conversations they've had with people, um, so much film that they've watched. And then, you know, as coaches, we come in and supplement the process, but not to the scale that they've put in the time and effort. So um, it's a little bit different feeling probably than they have. And, uh, you know, certainly it's, it's fun to watch the work that they put in and how prepared they are for these moments. And then uh, yeah, I've enjoyed watching them throughout this process. They do such a good job for us. There's more and more of them now in college football. Is that uh, thinking about is it the future of the league, or are we comfortable having smaller receivers? Is that a conversation you feel like you've had to rethink now as you're seeing more and more of them? You just it, who fits you, who fits you, you know, and and uh, maybe there's a huge receiver, maybe there's a small receiver that fits us this year, uh, maybe there isn't, and so it's just. Uh, you know, different positions can fluctuate from year to year on, on the different body types you're going to face. Um, that'll look at you in the draft. Um, again, we just want guys that we, we have a vision for that can play a role for us. And, you know, sometimes the body type factors in, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes we just want a good football player that can fill some jobs for us. And so that's, that's as we assess the receivers, that's, that's what you look at. Do you see the league trending that way? Where you just have trending? I, I have a hard – small – you're just saying – Yeah, as far as having more smaller guys out there kind of like you see in college. Yeah. Hard for me to say it's trending that direction. Yeah. Um, there are some smaller body types in this draft. I, I have not thought back at last year's draft to see how this compares to that. Uh, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but I, I don't have a great answer for you there. I 
Well, you're in there because they make us put a camera in there, so they, they get to see, you know. Um, it's, um, again, there's a lot of work that's been put in. Um, it's a great moment when you get a chance to, to make this selection and, and call the young man on the phone and give him the news. Um, and then, again, for the reward of all the work that those guys have put in that, that sit in that room with us. Um, you know, so, so again, we, we've got a really good group that we trust that um, they're good workers, they're smart scouts, and they put us in a really good position to be successful on the field on Sundays. And so uh, for me, I, I like the experience of being with those guys and seeing them put in the work and that payoff when you get to make that selection. It's 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 tricky uh, because you don't have the full picture until you see the video typically uh, because sometimes it's it's there's not much communication on the phone and it's usually because then you see the picture later and uh, you know they're emotional or whatever it is so I I don't always fully know um, because again there's there's a lot of prospects on the board so you don't you don't know in great detail all the personalities that you're dealing with on the phone you might know their background their character but you don't know the face to face personality when you're picking a guy in the fourth round or fifth round necessarily so I enjoy the process I enjoy delivering the news um, and then I, I really enjoy watching the videos afterwards of, of seeing how they took that call and piecing all that together. Is the video different from what it sounds like in your ear? No, sometimes it just helps you piece together the puzzle, you know, of, of uh, how many people that you never know. They have one person in the room, they're, they're inside in the living room, they're outside on their patio. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a game I can play, trying to picture where they were, and then, and then you get a chance to see the video and put it all together. No, um, no, I, I wouldn't say one that stands. I can remember a couple of them, but I, I wouldn't say the one that stands out in a, in a memorable way, one way or the other. Are there, are there attributes that you find valuable in, in defensive tackles, defensive ends, when they're, when they're, you have first round grades on them? Are there certain attributes that they bring to the table of being able to play that position that they, you kind of find superior? Just what, what fits our needs. And, and as you're asking that question, I'm thinking through a number of guys, and, and you, can, you can say that they have different attributes, you know, and, and we like. Many of them have liked some in the past. And so I can't say there's one thing I'm going to tell you that this is exactly what we're looking for because um, there's always different guys from year to year that fit different needs that maybe play the same position. Um, but for us, they might play different positions. So um, I don't feel comfortable saying there's one trait that you're looking for. Um, mean on game day, I guess, is one, you know, and, and find guys that, that can be mean and violent on game day. I think they're very rare um, because they, they hit so many of the top traits you'd be looking for. Um, you know, smart, tough, and dependable are, are three things that stand out immediately. Um, both of them are really good against the run and can affect the passer as well. Um, so, again, I think we're very fortunate with those two guys as starting D tackles and what we've got. And um, that's it's a rare one two mix that you got there with all the traits they bring to the table. Quickly, back to that payoff you mentioned. I, I think I separate the two, to be quite honest with you. Um, you know, once they're in the building, they're just one of us, and it doesn't really matter where, where they got drafted, what round, undrafted free agent, free agent that we acquire. You know, that all kind of goes out once we start getting in here and doing football stuff. And um, everybody's here for a reason. It doesn't matter what you got paid, where you got drafted. Um, you're just here to help us win. And, and so I, I think I, I really differentiate between the two situations. What are your thoughts on this year's pack of tight ends in the draft? I think it's a good class. You know, it, it, again, it depends. They've all got different traits. They've all got different sizes. Um, depends on what you're looking for. And uh, but, I, but I think top to bottom, it's a, it's a good class of tight ends. What are you looking for? Yeah, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. But again, we've, we've got guys in that room that I really like. They're all here for a reason. Uh, from t from top to, to the perceived bottom, I guess you could say. It, it's a really good group of guys that um, I think is going to have a great opportunity to come in here and compete for roles. You know, even guys that were on our practice squad last year showed us really good things. Um, they're going to have great opportunities to come in here and compete. And if we add to the mix, we add to the mix. Um, but I don't feel like it's something that we have to do because I think we put ourselves in a really good position with the guys that are in the room. Pass blocking or run blocking? Just blocking in general from that. Yeah. 
Well, it's important in the run game. You know, they, they can't run away from some of the responsibilities they're going to have. You, you try not to put them in the worst situations, but over a long season, they're going to be put in some, some tough t situations. And sometimes a stalemate's a good thing. Um, you know, in pass protection, we, we don't <laughs> – we try to try to not put them in one-on-one -on -one situations often. Sometimes it's unavoidable. Sometimes you got to call play action on first and second down. And unless you're just – um, want to manufacture all your play actions and never ask your tight end to do it. Um, it's a difficult thing to do. Sometimes uh, people do a real good job of getting you to check to a, to a um, seven-man protection on third down um, because it's cover zero, and then they bail out of it, and now all of a sudden you got your tight end on a defensive end. Not what you want necessarily, but um, they've, they've made it that way. And so uh, I think you look for guys that are smart enough to understand the different roles they're going to have to play, and they're willing to do it all. Um, they may be stronger in some areas than other, but – um, again, I, I can go round and round on the traits we want from our tight ends, but ultimately, that again, that's why you got three or four guys in a room active on game day, and some of them maybe have different strengths than the other guys, and they can fit some different roles for you. Jose, you talk a lot about the cohesion that the coaching staff and the scouts have in, in terms of identifying the physical traits that you want and then character makeup and all that. Is it is it tougher in terms of scope, whereas I would imagine the coaching staff is all in on we want guys that help us win this year, or maybe the front office might have more of a wide angle, wide angle lens? I think it's it's good to have both viewpoints, you know, and, and I think that's where our discussions are always really good in that room of people not being afraid to speak up and, and say what they think short term and long term. Uh, because maybe you're only thinking short term and you hear something about a long term vision that really makes sense to you and helps you reframe your thought process uh, bet between prospects, maybe. Um, so I, I think that we always have the necessary dialogue that really helps us find the best player that fits the Bengals. Um, and, and you always want a long term vision on these guys. You want to bring them in here because you feel like it fits what we want to do long term. Uh, but I, I think we have those discussions that, that make us think um, the right way as we, as we evaluate these guys. Um, I, when you ask the question, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, T and Logan, you know, both of those guys. But, but again, that's how you graded them. So it doesn't mean everybody grades them that way. We, we think highly of them because we have high grades on them. Um, maybe nobody else did. Obviously, it's paid off for us, um, so we can pat ourselves on the back. But um, you always have higher grades than everybody else, seemingly, when you, when you pick a player to short spot. Everybody else passed on that player. So, uh, But those are two guys that stand out where – you, you really didn't think they were going to be there, and then they were, and you were pretty excited about it. Logan, I guess, too, late in the second round, I guess there were a couple teams that needed backers. And yeah, Logan's the guy I can remember watching 30 picks tick off the clock, you know, with your fingers crossed. Um, he's, he's one, and there's certainly been other guys, I'm sure, that fit that description, but he's one I, I can remember uh, from about pick, what was T, 33? From about pick 34 to whatever we drafted Logan, you're just crossing your fingers and watching the clock. <laughs> Our scouts, you know, you just trust the scouts. They've put in that work. Um, you know, the phone calls I make are typically to people that I really trust, you know, um, maybe I've worked with or, or have a close relationship with because otherwise it, it's difficult. You know, it's people always want to support their players and see their players do well. And so it, it's, it's, it can be tough to read through the lines. But um, our scouts, that's, that's, they put in that legwork, and so you, you trust their evaluations on those guys. Yeah, hard, hard for me to know how they get the full picture on them. You know, that's, they're, they're in the buildings. They're talking to their people. They're watching the practices. They've, they've watched all these games of these guys, you know, probably week to week as the games have happened, whereas as coaches, we're watching them all, um, you know, really in probably March 1st on, and we're watching all together, whereas they've had a clearer picture for a longer time period, um, and we're really just trying to catch up. And then, and then you do the Zooms with guys. You bring guys in on top 30 visits. You bring them in on your top 45 visits to the Combine. Uh, so there, there's a lot of different ways you try to gain information on these prospects. You're talking about how you enjoy kind of this last couple months in the process. Is it different when you look back at like 2019 or teams that have to draft a quarterback in the top five? Is there more pressure in the room than there is like in a year like where you don't have that sort of hanging over you guys? Uh, 
I haven't really felt that because we, we had the number one pick and we knew we were taking Joe Burrow and there was no pressure. It was, it was we all felt really good about it. And so I, I haven't had to experience that. I can't speak for other teams. Um, I'm glad we're not in that position, obviously. That's a big piece of the puzzle. But um, I don't know that I really did a great job answering your question. But, but you, think, you think it would be different if you had like the second or third pick at that spot? Would and you need a quarterback? Yeah. yeah. I can't, I've never been there. So that's a hypothetical that I, I can't really answer. I was hopeful. I was hopeful in the seventh round, I think, is where my antennas were up. Um, John Gruden called me uh, probably early seventh round and started recruiting me. And then I was like, ah, oh, that's not good. <laughs> you start getting recruited. I, I know how that works, trust me. So, uh, and then my head coach from Bill Callahan called me and started pushing me that way. And I was like, oh, this isn't good. Um, my father in law was at the Texans. They didn't pick me, um, they took Jared Zbranski over me. Um, uh, not that I've forgotten that or anything, but uh, no, it's it's it, it, looking back. I, I think I was an undrafted college free agent, and and uh, my sons always ask me all the time why I didn't get drafted. I say hey, it's okay having a, a solid college career and being a solid college player is fine. That's acceptable. We got a lot of those guys upstairs in this building, um, on the mezzanine and on A2 that were were, were solid college football players, and now we coach and we scout. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, but I think I probably got picked where I was supposed to get picked. Did you ever see a scouting report? Um, one, one at Miami, someone forwarded to me one time, you know, it was, it was good from a character standpoint. I was proud of that. <laughs> so I think my mom would be proud of the, the scattering report. Yeah. 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 I, I got duped. You know, I got brought in to, to run the rookie free agent, uh, Tampa Bay. I didn't know it at the time, but I was the only guy that probably called the plays because it was the same offense I ran in college. So, um, I could call the play in the huddle and get people lined up. And hand the ball off, and then uh, and then that was about the extent of my needs there in Tampa. So they, they moved on from me. I don't think we've got a chance to ask you this uh, this, this offseason, but with all the panic stuff with Joe Mixon situation, does that have any impact on his future with the team long term? How do you kind of view that as a case of case? Of we'll ju- we'll just let that play out. Yeah. How do you compare the coaches of what you know, like I you know you did with Miami and uh, the Rams? How do you compare the coaches? Of I think it's valued. Yeah, I, I don't want to compare uh, to the other places here. I, I feel like our voices are valued, you know, and that's that's not saying anything about LA or Miami. That's just here. And and um, again, I, I always try to fall back on. Sometimes I, I like to talk, but the scouts have put in a ton of work, and and their imp- opinion should should be up there at the top. And um, again, we're there to supplement it, maybe to portray the vision I'd have on a player if we selected him. Um, I haven't watched the same tape on all the prospects that these guys have, and so I always uh, prefer to, to what they they have done the work on. But um, we do appreciate as coaches that our opinions are asked, and they want to hear it out, and then they want to, you know, Duke does a great job of managing all that and putting the prospects in order of how they would best help us. Have you ever seen anyone actually stand on a table? <laughs> no, I don't think I don't think I have. I, I don't think I have. No. Have you, have you ever seen? What are those conversations like when you're like, wow, this is. Really- Can you tell when some people really have true, passionate feelings? Sure. You know, these last couple of weeks, do you see a lot of that? Is there a little of that? Um, I I think you've had so many conversations about these guys that you 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 know um, if somebody really likes somebody else, that's that's fine, you know. And and um, yeah, I I can't give you a great story there of of a moment. Um, I mean, yeah, if I like a guy, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that I like a guy, you know. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's where those conversations are great, and that's why we've had them for weeks and months. Um, there's always times you you maybe have a, a low evaluation of a guy, and you hear somebody else that you respect has a really high evaluation of them, and it makes you want to go back and maybe look at it in a different lens. Maybe you were just having a bad day, and and uh, so I, I yeah, plenty of times you go back and make sure that you're not misevaluating a player um, one way or the other. Am I too high on this player? Am I too low on this player? Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I think, you know, 
there's a lot of really good voices in that room, and and ultimately, um, you know, we've got some ones that I respect, and and so those decisions usually play out in a really good way. And it's not like it's not done like draft day. It's, those discussions are like before the draft, right? Yeah. Well, I think that's where the experience in our room is invaluable. You know, you look at how many drafts Mike's been a part of, um, how many drafts Duke's been a part of, just specifically here at Cincinnati. It's unheard of, you know, probably 20-something, I would guess. And so their, their experience really kicks in. They've seen every situation. They can anticipate every every uh, point that's going to come up when you're comparing prospects. They, they can um, – Kind of foreshadow some of the conversations that we're probably going to be having when we're on the clock, so they have them now. And so that, that's where the experience really kicks in from um, the people in the room. That's kind of what I was alluding to earlier, and um, that, that's where you know I'm, I'm inexperienced in that way. You know, I'm just in my fifth year here compared to um, some people that we have the luxury of leaning on. And so I think that stuff's invaluable, um, and and we appreciate that, and it helps us lead to really good selections when we're on the clock.